When you hear the name Wes Craven, you don't typically think of failures. Sure, movies like Shocker and The Serpent in the Rainbow might not have set the box office on fire, but they were great films nonetheless. This is a man that not only defined an entire era of horror, he defined three eras of horror. Two of the best horror films to come out of the 70s were The Hills Have Eyes and The Last House on the Left. Both were directed by Craven, and both left their marks on viewers. Craven exploited the fears that Americans have about, well, themselves. The films capitalized on America's paranoid and panicked fear of the stranger down the street. Films where the monsters weren't inhuman or superhuman. They really weren't monsters at all. They were really just dirtier and scarier versions of ourselves. By the late 70s, early 80s, horror films had moved on to a new rogue genre, the slasher film, and Wes Craven sliced his way into this genre by bringing to life a sadistic psychopath named Freddy Krueger in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, the Nightmare franchise went on to help carry the genre to its highest points and, well, let's be honest, some of the genre's lowest as well, although Craven himself tried to revitalize things with his underrated Wes Craven's new nightmare, which arguably paved the way for what was to come next. When slasher films seemed to be running on fumes, recycling the same sad ideas year after year, Craven collaborated with writer Kevin Williamson in what would become the first of many such collaborations and introduced audiences to Scream, which gave the slasher a very postmodern makeover, turning the camera towards his own pop culture obsessed audience to create a killer. With the benefit of hindsight, it cannot be argued that Wes Craven, perhaps an unlikely candidate to be a big horror director as man born into a working class fundamentalist Baptist family, was undoubtedly one of the most influential voices in the history of the genre. And deep within his incredible resume lies his attempt to possibly define a new era by revisiting an old horror creature long abandoned in 2005's Cursed. If you've seen it, then you, along with the rest of us, have probably asked yourself the same question. What the fuck happened to this horror movie? When you think of classic horror creatures, the werewolf is undoubtedly one of the first to come to mind, which is ironic really, in that there is such a slim selection of good films that tackle the territory. Movies like the original Wolfman starring Lon Chaney Jr. and Hammer's Curse of the Werewolf starring Oliver Reed are few and far between. However, something must have been in the water in 1981, a year that did Lycan lovers proud with films such as The Howling, Wolfen, and of course, An American Werewolf in London. Stephen King even tackled the creature a couple of years later in 1983 with The Cycle of the Werewolf, which was later made into Silver Bullet, which is worth mentioning just because of, well, Gary Busey. That also happened to be the same year as Teen Wolf, starring Michael J. Fox as a basketball playing guy who's both a teen and a wolf. But sadly, after that year, werewolves took a backseat to more common horror monsters like zombies, vampires, and of course your common slasher. When they did turn up, well, the results weren't pretty. Anybody remember Teen Wolf 2 starring Jason Bateman? I'm sure that he'd rather you forget it. Or even worse, an American werewolf in Paris? Oof, I really hope not. The early 80s is long gone and the hype behind werewolves on film has never been the same, but they've still popped up from time to time, being the centerpiece of genre spoofs like Wolf Cop, where he's a wolf and a cop, which we couldn't make up if we tried, and also popping up in different franchises like Underworld, the TV show Penny Dreadful, which is very underrated, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Hell, even Harry Potter did the werewolf bit justice in The Prisoner of Azkaban. But the delight of seeing man to werewolf metamorphosis on screen is a process audiences seem to be tiring of. Enter Wes Craven. After a script was finished in August of 2000, Dimension announced the production of Cursed in the August of 2002 with a planned release date of August 2003. With Wes Craven signed on to direct, Bob Weinstein, now infamous as part of the Weinstein brothers, promised that the film would be a reinvention of the werewolf drama that horror fans had been waiting for. Dimension envisioned this as another franchise for Wes Craven, and much like Scream before, the hope was that Craven would create at the very least another trilogy, but with the lore of werewolves as the center of the plot this time around. The title of the film is actually quite apropos in this instance because of the issues that the production faced for the movie just to see the light of day. Now, the original plot isn't at all what made it to the screen. 
and it was said to have centered around three main characters who were strangers brought together by a car accident up in the Hollywood Hills, followed by what would appear to be a werewolf attack. The three characters were to be played by Christina Ricci, Jesse Eisenberg, and Skeet Ulrich, who was set to reunite with Wes Craven after what was arguably his most well-known performance in 1996's Scream. Just how much of the original version of Cursed was shot is up for debate, but rumor has it virtually an entire film was shot and in fact Entertainment Tonight visited the set to visit Ulrich and Ricci as it was in production. Hi E.T., welcome to the set of Cursed. Hollywood is known as a dog-eat-dog -dog town, but in their new movie Cursed, Skeet and Christina find that out the hard way when they come face to face with a werewolf. Here's what eventually made it to the screen. Cursed, as we know it, centers on Ellie, played by Christina Ricci, and her brother Jimmy, played by a young Jesse Eisenberg. Out driving one night, they're involved in a terrible car accident on Mulholland Drive. In this already stressful situation, the two are struggling to save a woman who's been trapped under her car from the accident, only to have an unneeded and out of left field appearance by a werewolf ruin their attempts by tearing the trapped woman, played by Shannon Elizabeth of American Pie, to pieces and injuring Ellie and Jimmy in the process. It becomes clear over the course of the movie that the scratches the siblings sustained from the werewolf are part of a deadly curse and would soon transform them into werewolves themselves. Of course, there's much more to the plot than that, like a CGI werewolf dog, the creature being extremely petty and self-conscious, and the curse itself being transmitted during a one-night stand like some kind of folklore STD. None of this seemed quite like what Russ Craven would have intended, and it turns out it really wasn't. Here's how it all went down. Curse was postponed just four weeks shy of wrapping principal photography due to quote-unquote script problems. The Weinsteins had concerns about the film's third act and some of the special effects they had seen. Those quote-unquote script problems resulted in Kevin Williamson, the writer and longtime collaborator of Craven, being ordered to do a complete page one rewrite of the script based off of new plot points handed down by the studio. Oh yeah, and then there's also everything that went down with Rick Baker. Now, as a horror fan, you have to be familiar with the name. And if you're not, well, come on. Known for doing makeup on The Wolfman and The Howling and being responsible for the effects that brought an American werewolf in London to life, all of which would have made him arguably the guy for a movie like this, Barker's name is cemented in film history as he is an Oscar winner and a horror legend, which meant exactly nothing to the Weinstein brothers as Baker was fired from production and his design scrapped. The Weinsteins instead opted to go the all CGI route as opposed to practical effects and those CGI effects, let me tell you, worth every penny. No. These issues prolonged the production for so long, it resulted in several cast members being cut altogether because of long-winded delays caused by many scheduling conflicts. Among the cast lost were Mandy Moore, Omar Epps, Robert Forster, Scott Foley, Corey Feldman, Skeet Ulrich, and even Heather Lagenkamp. You heard that right, Heather Lagenkamp. Those were two huge Wes Craven reunions the audiences never got to see. We missed out on a whole lot of chemistry in lieu of one jump scare after the other. However, we did still get Scott Baio as himself. So, not all is lost, I guess. Some of the actors that were removed from the story even filmed scenes or finished their dates entirely, but were ultimately cut by Craven because they no longer fit with the many script rewrites that had taken place. Cursed would ultimately go on to see a full two years of delays, which not only affected the final product, but ultimately affected the story itself, as the character of Ellie originally started off as a segment producer for The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. But by the time the film had come out, Craig Kilborn had already stepped down from his position in Late Night and had been replaced by Craig Ferguson. Over those two years of delays, Bob and Harvey Weinstein repeatedly demanded changes to the plot. The film was written and shot with the intention of it being released with an R rating, as they'd done with the Scream franchise, but in the fall of 2004, Dimension had it cut down to a PG-13 rating in the hopes that a younger audience would flock to see it in theaters, as this was the era of PG-13 horror. They thought that this PG-13 would guarantee them more financial success, but it did not. Although in an odd twist, Canadians actually got to see the R-rated cut in theaters with the Canadian distributor Alliance Atlantis opting to release that version instead. The film grossed slightly over $19 million at the North American box office and about $10 million internationally for a worldwide gross of just over $29 million against a budget of $38 million. Translation, 
Cursed was a box office bomb. And critics seem to agree with audiences. Based on 96 reviews, it currently holds a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. The San Francisco Chronicle panned the film, writing Cursed is a third right effort with a weak script, cheap looking effects, and no genuine frights. Film Threat took it a step further, alluding to the film's legacy by stating not only does it not make movie history, until this past Friday the worst werewolf film ever made was, Harry hands down, Mike Nichols' Wolf, Cursed now assumes that dubious distinction and someone is going to have to try very, very hard to wrestle it away. Just one month after its release, Wes Craven could no longer hold his tongue about the experience. When asked by the New York Post if the studio had asked for the PG-13 rating, Craven opened the floodgates, stating, I'm very disappointed with Cursed. The contract called for us to make an R-rated film. We did. It was a very difficult process. Then it was basically taken away from us and cut to a PG-13 and ruined. It was two years of very difficult work and almost 100 days of shooting various versions. Then at the very end, it was chopped up and the studio thought they could make more money with a PG-13 movie and trashed it. We were writing while we were shooting. It wasn't ready to film. We rewrote, recast, and had two major reshoots. It went on and on and on. After a while, I regretted it was called Cursed because you know what? It was cursed. It was just chopped up and it was awful. I thought it was completely disrespectful and it hurt them, the studio, too. It was like they shot themselves in the foot with a shotgun. In the end, Cursed, like many films before it, was just a prime example of a studio getting too heavily involved and ruining their own product. And while we're on the topic, Cursed is also a prime example of why horror fans don't trust major studios to produce their genre film. Sure, Craven may be a little more commercial than some of our favorites, but who in their right mind would ever trust the creative direction of Bob Weinstein over Wes Craven when it comes to horror? When this edition hits YouTube, the movie will have turned 15 years old. And all these years later, we can all imagine what the film might have been like had Craven just been left to his own devices. Could he have defined another era of horror? Did this film ever have the chance of reinvigorating the werewolf genre? When you take the combination of director, the makeup, special effects artists, and the huge cast that was assembled at the start, the original team behind it alone should have and would have equaled the success. In the end, the production nightmare of Curse just leaves us with so many questions. Why was the original story changed? Why was the film shut down for such a long story overhaul when it was a mere four weeks away from wrapping production? Why would you interfere with the creative process of a veteran horror filmmaker who had delivered for your studio time and time again? If he and the writer of the film had had so much success for your studio in the past, why on earth would you demand so many rewrites and let go of the crew that many would deem as experts in the genre? Lastly, what about the final cut seems better than the original story in any way? In our opinion, Cursed is truly an awful film, but that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable in some ways. Many viewers actually find it quite entertaining, but for all the wrong reasons, sharing clips of the cheesy CGI, the over-the-top performances, and of course, that middle finger. The most frustrating aspect of all is that it had so much promise. It really could have been a reintroduction to a long underused genre of horror, but in the end, the production was cursed from the start. For Joe Blowhor, I'm Chris Bumbray. Mm -hmm.